this is Judith Lay, and it's my privilege to once again be at your service. Man's Radio. Maramai, good morning. Had it not been for the COVID-19 pandemic, services of commemoration would have been taking place around the island in celebration of the peace that was declared 75 years ago, ending the war in Europe. Using some of the specially chosen hymns and prayers and involving some of the people who would have taken part in those church services to celebrate the 75th anniversary of VE Day, At Your Service This Morning pays tribute to the millions at home and abroad who gave so much so we can enjoy freedom today. The freedom that was so threatened in the autumn of 1939. The whole country knew that there was to be no peace for our time. And on the 3rd of September, 1939, this. This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. The German war is at an end. We may allow ourselves a brief period of rejoicing. Today is victory in Europe day. This was the moment we'd all been waiting for. Enormous crowds had gathered outside the house and all over the centre of London to hear the end of the war in Europe, officially announced by the Prime Minister. I saw it. In the small hours of this morning, May the 7th, 1945, I saw the formal acknowledgement by Germany's present leaders of their country's complete and utter defeat by land, in the air and at sea. The final act, General Jodl's signed admission of unconditional surrender, had little or nothing outwardly dramatic about it. If the sense of drama was there, and it was, It was because we carried it in our own hearts, remembering that this meant liberation, freedom from suffering, and spared lives for countless thousands in tortured Europe. Dear friends, on this day we commemorate the 75th anniversary of victory in Europe. We are conscious of our need for God's forgiveness, for the sin and the desire to dominate others that leads to conflict between people and war between nations. And as we remember the many soldiers, sailors and airmen who gave their lives restraining evil and opposing tyranny, So we also come in thanksgiving for the years of peace that the nations of Europe have enjoyed since the Second World War. Like those who gathered on that first victory day, we are grateful for the laughter and love that follows times of sadness and loss. But above all things, let us pray that God's will may be done on earth as it is in heaven as we join our voices together and pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven, sung there by the Huddersfield Choral Society, was one of the hymns sung 75 years ago in a special VE Day service of Thanksgiving held in Westminster Abbey. There'll be more hymns from that service throughout the programme. And the wonderful arrangement of Ellen Vannin for trumpet is the work of Manxman Jason Evans, who is principal trumpet in the Philharmonia Orchestra. You'll hear more of Jason's remarkable playing later in the programme, and he has dedicated his unique performance of Ellen Vannin to key workers all over the world. Our prayers today are led by the Venerable Andy Brown, who in addition to being the Archdeacon of Man, is also Isle of Man County Chaplain to the Royal British Legion and to the Royal Air Force Association Isle of Man. Mark Tiley is a familiar voice each weekday morning here on Manx Radio, but before coming to the island, he spent nearly 30 years as a British Forces broadcaster, moving all around the world, often working in present-day war zones. He brings us The Tribute to the Millions, a reflection written specially for this anniversary. But before that, the voice of one lady speaks for the countless men and women who quietly did what they could, never looking for praise or even for recognition. Ten years ago, I was invited to interview a group of ladies who had been amongst the first to join the Women's Institute on the island some 60 years earlier. That was how I met Mrs. Betty Krebin, who just happened to mention in passing what she'd done during the war. I went for an interview for a war job. I went up to London and I was a comptometer operator and they said, oh, well, we could do with somebody like you who has a, an idea about machines. Well, of course, but when I got to Bletchley, I couldn't believe it. I mean, the machines wouldn't go through the doorway here. They were huge and the noise. They had a school there at Bletchley that you went to learn the machines. It wasn't something you could just do. You had to be very, very careful. People would try and get you to say what you were doing and that. There were so many different spheres 
of this sort of work in the uh, in the wars, and lives did depend on it. It was top secret. When you think about it now, it's like a dream, really, you know. Let us remember those who so selflessly gave their lives at home and abroad, whose sacrifice enables us to enjoy the peace and freedom we have today. Let us remember those who came home wounded, physically and mentally, and the friends and family who cared for them. Let us remember those who returned to restore their relationships and rebuild their working lives after years of dreadful conflict and turmoil. Let us remember the families that lost husbands, sons and sweethearts. Let us remember the servicemen, merchant seamen, miners, brave civilians and others from Commonwealth and Allied countries who fought, suffered and died during four years of war. Let us remember those in reserved occupation and the brave people who kept us safe on the home front the doctors and nurses who cared for the wounded, the women and men who toiled in the fields, those who worked in the factories, who all played such a vital role in the war effort at home. O Lord our God, as we remember, teach us the ways of peace. As we treasure memories, teach us to hope. As we give thanks for the sacrifices of the past, Help us to make your future in this world until your kingdom come. Amen. Now thank we all our God, another of the hymns from the original service of thanksgiving held in Westminster Abbey 75 years ago. Before becoming the Lord Bishop of Soda and Man, the Right Reverend Peter Eagles had over 20 years of military service, first as chaplain to the forces and then as archdeacon to the army. And he joins us now to explain what he feels is at the heart of this anniversary. What is it about VE Day that really captures the imagination? The answer, I think, has to be quite simply, it's about joy. And if you look at the footage of the celebrations in May 1945, then that is the message that comes through very clearly. It's about people simply rejoicing, rejoicing in something that they perhaps never even thought would happen. And perhaps to understand that, we need to put ourselves, if we can, into the shoes of those people who celebrated in May 1945 who had been living in the darkness and the shadow of war for six years that it must seem at that time were never going to end. And I'm reminded of words from a famous speech that said, this is not the end, this is not the beginning of the end, but it may be the end of the beginning. And those were words spoken by the Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, in November 1942, after the Battle of El Alamein, which was a turning point in the war, a long way away in North Africa, of course, but it was nonetheless a turning point. And Churchill reflected on that in terms of not the end, not the beginning of the end, but the end of the beginning. And we might perhaps see ourselves in a similar situation at the moment, as we've moved from that first phase of suppressing the virus into a second phase, a phase of coexistence and living with it. So perhaps in a way we too have reached the end of the beginning in the war in which we're currently engaged. And just as Churchill used that phrase about the end of the beginning to refer to the turning point at the Battle of Egypt, as he called it, 
so too we stand in a similar situation at the moment, moving from the beginning into the next phase. And perhaps then we might take not just shared joy, but inspiration as well from our friends of 1945. And remember that the point is this, we keep the end in mind without knowing when it will come or when it will be. We work towards it. We realise that every deed, every step, every action is part of our journey towards that end. And we live in the present. Our minds are focused on the realities of every day. But then there will come a point when we emerge into the daylight of victory and the end and the return to things that are forgotten and yet familiar. In November 1942, when those words were spoken, there was much darkness still to come. But the end came. It came later, in May 1945, two and a half years later. So for today, we take away this thought that our minds, fixed at the moment on the realities of everyday life, look towards the joy that is to come. So my prayer for us is that however you spend these days, and of course we're limited in what we can do, my prayer is that you may have a sense of that joy of May 1945 and a hope of the joy to come in our own day when the sky is clear, as they surely will. Reverend Joe Dudley is the vicar of Christ Church in Laxey. For her, as for so many people, VE Day is bound up in some very personal family memories. I am too young to have been on this earth for VE Day. I was born in the very early 50s. My mother was born in a little village in Leicestershire. She did not attend school after the age of seven due to rheumatic fever. Her mother's first husband had died from wounds in the First World War and she had married Mum's dad when he already had adult children. At the age of 14, my mum went to work at the home of her half-brother, who was a butcher near Birmingham. She was 18 on the 1st of March 1939. As war became imminent, it also became clear that girls in that area would be taken into munitions factories. Mum took the initiative and volunteered and was accepted into the Women's Royal Air Force. She did her training and passed out as a cook and was stationed at RAF Docking in Norfolk. My dad lived in Essex. He was born in 1911 and was in a reserved occupation working for the council. As the war progressed, less and less staff were needed in the department in which he worked. He was called up to serve his country just before his 30th birthday. He too went into the Royal Air Force. After initial training, he was stationed at RAF Docking as an air traffic controller. He was an accomplished pianist and soon had his own band and was a bar steward and hey presto, he met the cook. He was not there very long before being shipped out to serve the rest of the war in India. Mum became the cook for the air chief marshal who lived at Docking Hall. I wish I had written all the stories she told me down, but I didn't. They are written into my mind. Dad would not talk of his war experiences, but Mum was very proud of what she had done and I know she realised how it had changed her life, as it did so many folk, many thousands or actually millions, sadly by loss of life and loss of loved ones. When we had an egg for breakfast, she would recall how those going out on missions would be entitled to what was then a full breakfast, which she had helped to cook and serve, and then how sad it was to see the empty seats as crews did not return. 
Today we are celebrating 75 years since peace was declared with victory in Europe. Throughout my childhood, that day and Battle of Britain Day were so important and were remembered in prayer at the church services. Mum had claimed the two medals to which she was entitled and always wore them with pride on those days. Dad wanted nothing to do with it all, and it was not until he died that I claimed for Mum the two medals that he too, like all others who served in the war, were entitled to receive and wear. What of VE Day 1945? Well, I have vicariously lived that every one of my knowing years. I cannot really imagine my mother as the fit, leading aircrafts woman she would have been at 26. Her story was always the same year on year. With a group from Norfolk, they had gone up to London on transport, in other words, troop lorries, been dumped off and made their way to Buckingham Palace. She was not very tall and so no doubt assisted by others in the group, she had climbed a lamppost to get a view of what was going on. There has been so much footage of those days on the television this week. I would so love to have spotted her. But would I recognise a young woman in uniform amongst that huge throng? There seemed to be so many grabbing vantage points. My story is no different from others of my generation. My mother was robbed of her childhood by illness. She was robbed of her teenage years by having to work. Then she was robbed of her early twenties by a world thrown into chaos by war. The use of the word robbed is mine, not hers. She never once moaned or complained of those years. With VE Day did not come the end as Dad was still in India way past Christmas 1945. All their wartime papers had been in the same drawer in the house bought by my grandparents in 1942 and sold by me in 2018. I packaged those papers very carefully, but they have escaped me finding them in the vicarage. Amongst them was the order of service that Mum retained from having attended a VE Day service at Westminster Abbey, a true reminder and record of what happened on that day. Maybe it is meant to be that I cannot find that paperwork, leaving the story to linger on in my heart, and how I say thank you to my mum and dad and the thousands of other folks who served that we might live. My parents are a couple for whom the war brought love, and I was one of the results of that love. We shall celebrate in our own way today as we did on Friday, this year a bank holiday to show the world how much we value what those folks of that generation did for us. We celebrate today not as was planned with big gatherings and services, but maybe Zooming and other forms of the technology of today, or just privately committing ourselves in our thanking of the past generation to pledge to keep peace in our time and that of our children's children. All servicemen and women came home to a hero's welcome on VE Day, and it's for them that a second reflection has been specially written. Here's Mark Tiley once again with Unmentioned in Dispatches. Some of them never come home to fanfares. They dump their kit bags down at the door, kiss their wives and let their children wrestle them down to the kitchen floor. Some of them skip the quayside welcome, dodge the bunting and the cannonade, make their landfall in silent harbours, 
nod to the Coast Guard, but evade the searchlight of public scrutiny, like those engaged in the smuggling trade. Some of them land at lonely airfields, far removed from the celebration, hang their flying gear in a locker, catch a lift to the railway station, make for home and take for granted the short-lived thanks of a grateful nation. Some of them miss the royal salute, the victory parade along the Mall, the fly-past, the ships in formation passing the cheering crowds on the harbour wall, remembered only by friends and relatives. Some of them never come home at all. An act of commitment. Let us pledge ourselves anew to the service of God and our fellow men and women, that we may help, encourage and comfort others and support those working for the relief of the needy and for the peace and welfare of the nations. Lord God, our Father, we pledge ourselves to serve you and all humanity in the cause of peace, for the relief of want and suffering, and for the praise of your name. Guide us by your Spirit. Give us wisdom. Give us courage. Give us hope. And keep us faithful now and always. Amen. And I can think of no better way to end our programme today than with Ellen Vanin, arranged and every single note played by Manx musician Jason Evans, principal trumpet in the Philharmonia Orchestra. My thanks to Jason, to Mark Tiley, Reverend Joe Dudley, the Archdeacon, the Venerable Andy Brown, and to the Lord Bishop, the Right Reverend Peter Eagles, who are all socially distancing and all recorded their own pieces for this programme. All kinds of parties and gatherings were planned for this weekend prior to the COVID-19 crisis. But there is much wisdom in the words of Her Majesty the Queen, Lord of Man, who said, We cannot celebrate in the ways that we planned, but our streets are not empty. They are filled with the love and the care that we have for each other. And may it always be so. And that's all we've got time for this week. Our hymns today were all taken from the first ever VE Day Thanksgiving service in Westminster Abbey. But next week, I'll be choosing from my list of your requested hymns. So do please keep letting me know your favourites. You can email me anytime on judithlay at manxradio.com and lay is spelt L-E-Y. I'd love to hear from you and add your favourite hymn to my list. So just time for me to say thank you for your company and I leave you with the promise of prayers for a peaceful and healthy week for you and for those you love. I do hope you'll join me again next Sunday morning at half past nine as the churches of the island will once again unite to be at your service, living faith together. Bye-bye for now. Station, Manx Ray